last year, a few days after Russia invaded Ukraine, Ukraine applied for membership in the European Union. In principle, that was welcomed by the European Union, but in view of the immediate threat from Russia and to the lot of victims and enormous distractions, is this procedure likely to lead quickly to a promising development? In principle, accession to the European Union can serve two goals, the expansion of economic union and the expansion of politi the political community. In the context of the Yugoslavia wars, the expansion of the political community was seen as an instrument for stabilizing the Balkan states. Nevertheless, accession ne negotiations are for the most Balkan states still ongoing. Now is the situation of Ukraine and probably Moldova is much more dramatic as the situation in the Balkans. And long enduring stalemate poses just as many risks as a too rapid accession that jeopardizes the domestic economy. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Professor Dr. Roman Petrov. Mr. Petrov, held the Chair of European Law at the Mohylia Academy, the National University in Kiev, since, two, since 2010. At the same time, he heats there the Institute of International and European Law. He has taught at numerous European universities as a guest lecturer. He is a much sought after consultant in Kiev, as well as by the European institutions. He has been associated with the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law as a Philip Schwarz Fellow since 2022. As you know, we are organizing this lecture series with the support of the Max Planck Institute and our sponsoring association, the Württemberg Library Society. The lectures will be video conferenced and streamed. If you want to participate from outside, please write your questions in the chat. You ask in German or in English as you like it. We will bring you up during the discussion in the hall. The discussion itself will not be recorded. Now, Mr. Petrov, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, uh, especially in Stuttgart, in this wonderful bibliotech. Uh, it's always nice to speak at, uh, in the uh, bibliotech uh, library hall. Uh, and um, indeed, I currently, right now, I'm based in Heidelberg at, as Schwartz, uh, Philip Schwartz Fellow uh, at the Institute for International and Comparative Law. And uh, my uh, Ukrainian affiliation comes from the National University of Kyiv Magila Academy, which is, and you can see on the slide, uh, a view, one of the views of my beautiful, small, but ancient university founded in 17th century as a very first Orthodox university in, uh, uh, in so Kyiv Rus, basically. And today I'm going to, since I'm, I have devoted all my professional life to the to EU law, especially to the issues related of European integration of Ukraine, association agreement and accession. And I'm going to talk about uh, the issue what concerns basically all Ukrainians today, and not only Ukrainians, but people here in Europe. Uh, the question is <clears throat> whether EU accession membership is possible and feasible in time of this devastating and cruel war in Ukraine. And it's a, it's a question which, of course, deserves a very thorough and um, expert uh, views and debate. So, yeah, so the structure of my short talk will be the following. First, I'm going to talk about historical, political, and legal prerequisites uh, of integration of Ukraine to the European Union. Uh, then I will uh, propose for your consideration, your attention, concept of um, the accession through war, which is now being discussed 
uh, mainly in academic circles, but I would really appreciate to hear your opinion on, on this. Then I'm going to deliberate briefly on whether classical accession is possible and uh, in time of war or accession through war is likely to happen. And last but not least, I'm going to offer for your consideration several options and scenarios for the peace deal between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, since, in, uh, in my opinion, uh, the uh, objective of EU accession and the peace deal are in it inevitably interlinked and come together. So, starting with the historical and political and legal uh, chronology of the EU-Ukraine accession, uh, the main message to be conveyed to you is that um, since independence of Ukraine in 1991, um, relations between Ukraine and the European Union could not be described as tango for two, or if it was a dance, it certainly was not synchronized. Why? Because uh, young Ukrainian government and independent state uh, has had very clear pro-European objectives uh, to, and desires, ambitions to join the European Union. And at the same time, the European Union did everything possible to distance, to keep Ukraine, as well as other pro-European countries of the post-Soviet area, away from giving any certain or even blurred promises for future membership in the European Union. This situation can be explained by different um, political and also historical status quo uh, in Ukraine and in the European Union. Why? Because simply um, in 90s and in uh, year 2004, 2005, the European Union had been heavily preoccupied with so-called big bank enlargement. There were 12 new member states which joined the European Union and uh, this uh, enlargement brought certainly benefits but also many problems for the European Union, especially for the EU founding uh, states. In these circumstances, the European Union simply could not afford uh, taking on board or even promising a membership for um, uh, newly independent post-Soviet countries like Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, or Armenia. And therefore, it was looking for devising new policies and um, uh, concepts how to keep these countries close to Europe, but at the same time to keep a distance, not to promise any uh, foreseeable um, enlargement. I even remember that when I was a much younger scholar, I had there was a meeting with um, Dutch foreign minister, and when uh, people asked him how soon Ukraine is going to join the European Union, he said simply and honestly, as uh, most Dutch people do, not in uh, my lifetime. And I looked at him, he was quite a young man, and I thought, wow, <laughs> there is no chance for Ukraine to join the European Union. However, everything has changed uh, in recent times. And on this um, slide, you can see just chronology of the EU-Ukraine relations since 2014. It was a time when the second revolution in Ukraine, so-called Dignity Revolution, took place. And this revolution, which resulted in uh, uh, basically change of regime and um, uh, President at that time Yanukovych fled the country uh, and basically his fleet triggered the, uh, the annexation of Crimea and um, uh, unrest and war in the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, which is called uh, Donbas area. At that time, basically one of the prerequisites of this very uh, turbulent and tragic uh, circumstances of Ukraine and basically start of a security crisis on the European continent, uh, it was um, the so-called association agreement. Association agreement 
uh, was negotiated and was about to be signed with Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia and Armenia, most pro-European post-Soviet countries. Uh, those association agreements were, as uh, president of the European Commission at that time, Barroso said, most ambitious external agreements ever negotiated and created by the European Union. Uh, huge in scope, ambitious in its tasks, more than 1,000 pages. Basically, those agreements covered all the whole array framework of the EU uh, competences and had in its objective um, push those countries to integrate into the European Union and to become uh, eventually so-called shadow members of the European Union. But only shadow. There were no promises whatsoever that those countries would ever join the European Union. So in the year 2014, these agreements, association agreements were eventually signed uh, in June 2014, but only signed with Ukraine, already the new president and new government, also with Moldova and Georgia. The government of Armenia voluntarily rejected this opportunity and instead joined a new integration project launched by President Putin, so-called Eurasian Economic Union, which was heavily modeled on the European Union as well as a customs union and supranational uh, entity. Uh, in year 2017, the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement entered into force simply because it took three years to ensure the ratification. One country, again the Netherlands, um, rejected uh, the ratification following a popular referenda which was lost by pro-European, pro-Ukrainian uh, circles. And uh, only after the parliamentary elections in the Netherlands, this agreement entered into force. Agreement envisaged deep and comprehensive free trade area and close cooperation of Ukraine basically in all areas of the EU competence, most importantly for Ukrainians, visa-free regime. But it was it came as a separate process at that time. So um, at that point, the European Union said, "Look, you have this ambitious association agreement. Its uh, duration is uh, not limited in time. It looks like you are going to be preoccupied with the implementation of this agreement for quite a long time." And again, as I already stated, there was no promise of the EU membership in this agreement. So nothing looked uh, shiny, nothing looked um, uh, receptive for any expectation of, the, of Ukraine's membership in the EU. At least I professionally believed that, well, there is no chance. It most likely Ukraine, as well as Moldova and Georgia, could have been in, uh, engaged into the implementation of this agreement for, for a decade at least, or even more. Uh, so ambitious this task, task looked for us. And suddenly, everything has changed just over a few, even weeks, as you all quite well aware. On 24th February last year, uh, Russia uh, unexpectedly uh, invaded Ukraine. And uh, just a few days later, in a very critical political circumstances, basically in a situation when Russian army was based almost 10, 15 kilometers from the residence of uh, so-called the governmental quarter, residence of president, uh, President Zelensky, as well as the Speaker of the Parliament and Prime Minister, surprisingly, surprisingly showed up and signed, solemnly signed the uh, letter, which uh, triggered uh, Article 49 of the Treaty on the European Union and asked uh, uh, the European Union to consider uh, the membership application uh, on behalf of Ukraine. It was very unexpected, but for lawyers, it was a long awaited moment because exactly a uh, preamble of the association agreement gave a right for Ukraine to apply anytime. Uh, in most 
In particular, Ukraine in preamble of this agreement was named as a European country, by the way, as well as Moldova and Georgia. Georgia was named East European. And exactly Article 49 of the European Treaty of the European Union stated that the first prerequisite for the application that any European country may apply. And I remember that quite a few European experts actually encouraged the Ukrainian government to apply after 2017 just to, set, to, test, to test the resilience of the EU institutions and to test what they were going to say in, in response. But it must be admitted, looking from today, that the moment to submit the application, especially in so tragic circumstances, on 28th of February, was chosen by President Zelensky with a perfect political instinct and precision. The ball was bounced into the corner of the EU institutions, and they simply uh, were in a situation how to, they faced a very difficult choice how to react. Basically, as I would like to argue, they had no choice. Their choice was simple, yes. Uh, we just cannot, in so, tra in so tragic uh, circumstances, decline a right for a country, which is for country which is fighting for its existence and survival, decline its future uh, membership in the European Union. So, for the very first time in, the, in European history, um, reaction of, from, on behalf of the EU institutions went so quick and predictable. Just um, as according to Article 49, the Commission, the European Commission, had to consider the application and to issue the report. It did it very quick, basically on 17th of June. Uh, governments of Moldova and Georgia were also quick to grasp the historic moment and they also submitted their application uh, letters and the Commission had to consider now three applications simultaneously. And no surprise, um, the report on behalf of the Commission uh, came up positive saying yes, yes, <laughs> Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia are ready to apply and to become members of the European Union. To this decision had to be endorsed by the European Council and uh, uh, there were concerns about position of one particular EU member state, which is uh, Hungary. And is, as you might know, there are quite complicated um, political relations between Ukraine and Hungary due to national minorities in the west of, of our country. However, the decision which came just a few days later on 24th of June 2022 from the European Council also was positive, saying yes, we endorse and we, uh, we consider those countries are ready to become EU members, conditional to fulfill certain, uh, certain um, uh, uh, reform objectives, mainly in the field of judicial independence, rule of law, protection of minorities, by the way and uh, legal reform. So basically, uh, in the course of last year, we witnessed a quite significant and considerable U-turn by the EU on its policy vis-a-vis post-Soviet pro-European countries, which in the course of a few weeks had to change their well-established policy of uh, distancing those countries from their objective to join the EU and actually welcoming, saying, yes, once you fulfill those criteria and once you comply, as you rightly said, with the Copenhagen criteria too, you are ready to start the membership negotiations. And of course, it was, um, it must be admitted, the main effect which, which was expected from this reply was a significant boost of um, resistance in Ukraine, of uh, Ukrainian civil community, civic community, and volunteers, and the most important from the army, because it, it was a very important part of, of national defense and resistance. So, uh, now we are in the situation when uh, this year, once the European Commission 
positively assesses, uh, if it assesses positively, of course, progress of Ukraine uh, to fulfill and to comply with all requirements uh, indicated by the European Council, the membership negotiations could be started, could be triggered either by the end of this year or by early next year, which is, of course, a very important historical development. At this point, it brings us to a question what any expert, either in political science, in law, history, could ask, excuse me, but is it ever possible for a country which is fighting, which is engaged in a very bloody conflict, which has already lost certain uh, estimation up to 100,000 uh, <coughs> combatants and civilians, as well as which suffered significant damage to its infrastructure and economy, whether this country would be able to actually participate, to be engaged into the accession process, which is already being uh, developed and articulated as a quite meticulous and um, advanced uh, technocratic process, when any candidate country is expected to perform and to show its performance within certain clusters. There are at least 35 clusters, basically within all areas of competence of the European Union. Is it possible or not? And it's a main question what we are going uh, to discuss today. Uh, basically, main, we are facing a very difficult choice of strategies to be pursued by the EU and by the Ukrainian government. Quite logically, I will focus mainly on the uh, accession application on behalf of the Ukrainian government. When we look and we uh, consider the EU strategy, the EU strategy, which has been already stated, is pretty predictable. It says, well, we are ready to support, we recognize your right to join the European Union. However, you must do and comply with all the requirements what other countries which have already joined the EU have had to comply, mainly the Copenhagen criteria, Madrid criteria, ability to implement to and to take on board all scope of the EU key within these 35 or even more clusters. And the most importantly, to fulfill a so-called rule of law and democratic um, uh, criteria, which is the most difficult to comply with. Strategy employed by the Ukrainian government is completely different. President Zelensky and his government say, we are ready to perform the accession in so-called, um, he says, turbo or hypersonic speed. We are ready to do it. We feel we can do it and we want to do it because we want to acquire the full membership as soon as possible. And of course, this strategy somehow do not come together uh, because evidently there is a conflict of interests. And here we, ca we come to the notion of the accession through war, which, uh, which must be considered whether country, and it happens for the very first time in history of the European Union, which uh, openly fights on a battlefield for, to defend and to promote European common values enshrined in Article 2 and 21 of the Treaty on the European Union, whether this country can be given certain credits, certain uh, special treatment, uh, certain understanding to allow to uh, to accelerate its accession process based on these circumstances. So it's a main question which, which we are going to consider. And um, Article 2 and 21, they basically define uh, the scope of the European Common Values. And um, European Common Values recently became very quite dominant agenda, internal agenda of the European Union. As you might well aware, uh, the European Union is very much concerned with already existence, existing EU member states, which do not perform 
which do not show uh, rigid and uh, necessary uh, sharing of common values, namely Hungary and Poland. And uh, the European Union has embarked upon legal procedures and uh, uh, judiciary procedures to push, to make governments of these countries to comply and to share common values. Therefore, of course, it puts the European Union institutions in a very difficult situation. So uh, if it, it's ready and wants to defend and, and uh, to preserve, safeguard its common values inside the EU, it also must do it externally. And Ukraine certainly is uh, now fulfilling its, this task, uh, not only in its policy, but basically by arms and lives of own people. In these circumstances, of course, we should ask question whether, again, what is going to win classical accession, which is based on a very mechanical and technocrat um, procedure, which has already been uh, developed and supported by the EU, or this approach called accession through war. However, both of this process, they require certain uh, challenges to be taken into account. Uh, for example, uh, one of these challenges is, of course, uh, the issue of uh, compensation and uh, re rebuild of Ukrainian economy, crippled economy, and there is a legal issue how to, uh, to use um, uh, Russian sovereign debt as well as property of Russian oligarchs in order to rebuild Ukrainian economy. It's one of the challenges. Another challenge, how to ensure and to, um, to provide help on behalf of the EU and EU member states for Ukraine. And last but not least, um, what's the role and um, uh, objective of a future peace deal? Because as we all know, any war eventually ends up with a peace deal, and how this peace deal is going to comply and uh, merge with the EU accession objectives. It's a, it's a very important uh, issue to be considered. When we talk about uh, support on behalf of the EU and EU member states for Ukraine, uh, it just um, must be admitted that the level of, of support is unprecedented. Uh, in many respects, the EU had to trigger tools which were staying waiting in waiting. For example, the temporary protection directive, which was in place for many years, but was triggered uh, and applied for the very first time with regard to Ukrainian refugees. As we all know, <clears throat> nowadays about 8 million Ukrainian refugees cross the border, including my family, of course, and um, about one million, even more than one million of Ukrainians end up in Germany, which is uh, quite an impressive figure. And they basically, <coughs> we can claim, enjoy the same rights as um, EU, members, uh, EU nationals with exception to political uh, rights. Next, uh, humanitarian assistance, as you can see, about half a billion euros. Solidarity lanes, it's a big EU project aimed at um, bringing Ukrainian grain from, uh, from the territory to Ukraine to the world markets. And uh, the European Union also invested considerably into this project. Then, uh, it's also an uh, um, issue of um, my, my, my macro financial assistance for Ukraine. And just in course of this year, you, uh, the European Union provided 18 billion euros to support Ukrainian budget and social expenditure. And um, also very important that for the very first time in its history, the European Union uh, provided military assistance, not by delivering uh, weapons on its behalf, but by funding the purchase of these weapons through so-called 
inst uh, peace facility instrument. It's a project initiative which was initially created by by the EU to support EU member states um, military reforms with a budget of about 5 million billion euros. But in the course of last year, all this money were used to purchase and to pay for military equipment, weaponry and ammunition to be delivered to Ukraine to support its resistance efforts. So all together, you can see just a brief look brief uh, glimpse at uh, the EU effort, not uh, talking and meeting uh, individual assistance programs in, uh, provided by the EU member states. So as you can see, the level of support is unprecedented, of course. <coughs> then, uh, at this point, I would like to offer for your attention the issue of the peace deal. And uh, uh, I take a courage to present for your consideration four options, which show uh, that um, any progress of the EU accession, as well as the NATO, by the way, Ukraine also uh, submitted an application to join NATO, uh, and um, it's uh, the process now in uh, pipeline, but um, there are uh, the NATO uh, decision-making institutions were not so quick, by the way, to to release their uh, reply uh, as the EU institutions were. So, uh, on this table, you can see that uh, any future progress of Ukraine to join the European Union as well as NATO basically depends on the situation on the battlefield. Uh, right now, we can see four options which um, uh, which uh, present uh, and define future accession outcomes for Ukraine. Option number one. Option number one uh, would imply complete military uh, victory for Ukraine and defeat for Russia, for the Russian Federation, and could lead to the liberation of the entire territory of Ukraine as of 1991, so within internationally recognized borders. So it implies, of course, Crimea and Donbass. Uh, in these circumstances, um, basically for, for sure, for certain, the current Russian, uh, current political regime in Russia is not, will not survive. Uh, possibly this option could actually could be a consequence of internal collapse and change of regime in Russia. And um, in these circumstances, um, we can also speculate that uh, the entire political system and borders of Russia also could change. And uh, in this uh, case, um, Ukraine is for sure would be able to launch almost immediately the EU accession negotiations, as well as most likely the NATO membership, because from a, from a military point of view, the ability of the Ukrainian army uh, and its um, flexibility to comply with the NATO standards is, is almost undisputable. Uh, so in this case, it's most likely to happen. Option number two uh, also would imply military victory for Ukraine. However, within borders which existed uh, on uh, 23rd February last year, basically on the eve of the invasion. It means without Crimea and Eastern Donbass. Uh, in this case, most uh, likely uh, it uh, could come into existence as a result of a successful military offensive by Ukraine. And uh, this option would also imply military and political defeat for the Russian Federation and most, most likely change of regime in Russia. Because from political point of view, the current regime would not be able to sustain such a defeat. Uh, it does not imply that Ukraine would reject and abandon the idea to restore its borders of 1991. It simply implies that the issue of the territorial status and sovereignty of Crimea and Eastern Donbas could be either postponed 
ought to be subject of a special agreement uh, under international public law. And it's, it certainly would be very interesting exercise for international public lawyers how to do it. And uh, when be, here be staying in Germany, I can see some interesting uh, options um, which might be considered. Uh, for example, um, options which uh, are related to the land of uh, Zarland, for example. However, it's, it's, it's an open question. And of course, in this case, the EU accession is also most likely to happen. And NATO possibly could be subject of compromise, but most likely also it would not meet any serious objective, uh, objections. Option number three. It's uh, basically could be called as a military draw and political draw. So basically it uh, uh, complies with the recent Chinese peacemaking plan. So immediate ceasefire uh, and also peace plan of one of potential American um, uh, presidential nominees. So peace in 24 hours. So when a party ceases um, um, to combat, and uh, basically stop at a front line as it exists now. It would certainly uh, could be could save the current Russian regime. It would imply that current Russian regime would stay in power because this option would certainly mean uh, military and could be interpreted as a military victory for the regime. And uh, from international public law, it would imply and trigger so many questions simply because according to current russian constitution <clears throat> uh, russia um, claimed as part of its territory regions not only of crimea and donbas but also Kherson and zaporizhia which are currently actually being most of its territory controlled by the by ukraine so basically it poses a question how to deal with uh, in, in case of draw with the status of these territories. Uh, and in this case, of course, the issue of um, NATO accession <coughs> could be questionable, considered, <coughs> excuse me, as a part of compromise, but EU accession possibly could take place, but um, it could be <coughs> Uh, actually uh, could uh, go on the same rails at, as a um, Cyprus, Cyprus issue uh, as Cyprus joins the European Union having a territorial um, territorial dispute uh, with Turkey. <coughs> and um, uh, last option which um, also must be considered <coughs> it's a military defeat for Ukraine and uh, it could take place in case in two cases first in case of um, uh, immediate seizure of assistance either political and military and economic by the by allies of ukraine and it must be admitted that without this assistance ukraine would not be thank you very much uh, Ukraine would not be uh, ready to continue its resistance. And um, uh, basically, in this case, Ukraine would face no option but to seize its um, military and uh, political fight. And second option, its application of uh, tactical unconventional weapons, including nuclear, and um, in this case, of course, um, Ukraine would also face a necessity to seize its resistance uh, in a very short period of time, because, as you all understand, it would pose very serious um, choices, possibly changes of strategies on behalf of Ukrainian allies. Uh, of a geopolitical nature. So, uh, in this case, of course, Ukraine, uh, in case of uh, scenario number four, is going to lose control of quite significant part of its territory. 
um, and territory, some of its territory could not be possible to actually to live on. And, um, and of course, the issue of the EU accession and NATO membership uh, could be certainly under question. So these are four major scenarios which we are facing. And uh, it must be if briefly, if we look at them briefly, it must be stated that uh, most, well, minimum, uh, as you know, Zelensky proposed its uh, 10 or 12 steps peace plan. And it's actually based on using option number two as a start, as a most feasible option when Ukraine would be able to, um, to sit at the negotiating table and to be engaged into the peace negotiations. There is uh, Russia, uh, the Russian Federation openly showed interest in uh, peace uh, negotiations, but based on uh, option number three, basically. So which implies a military and political draw. And uh, uh, in the end, we can also uh, discuss and speculate a little bit on issues of, uh, uh, of the following nature. Uh, so, for example, uh, how uh, the issue of accession of Ukraine to the EU and NATO can be considered as part of, um, uh, of, um, uh, of the entire accession process. Uh, how whether it could be defined from the very beginning or later on. It's a very interesting question. Second, there is a new institute of intergovernmental nature which just appeared uh, and was created following the initiative of the French President Macron called European Political Community. And uh, it would be interesting to see how uh, this institute and if this institute could play any role in achieving the peace. Uh, what's interesting is that the very first meeting brought some positive results, which related to the armenian azerbaijani conflict around Karabakh. The next meeting of the European political community is going to take place in Moldova. And as you know, Moldova is also now in a um, political and security crisis threatened by the Russian Federation. And uh, it would be interesting to see whether uh, this uh, community could be used as an effective uh, peace-making um, uh, platform for future. And another issue is, of course, is the scope of the so-called Copenhagen criteria. Yeah, it was rightly outlined this uh, this criteria basically comprise of three uh, bullet points first political and rule of law ability to offer candidate country to join the european union basically ability to share val democratic values rule of law and effective judiciary second criteria is economic ability to sustain pressures of eu internal market and third is the uh, ability to implement uh, the whole scope of the EU acquis. So the question is how um, should we stick to this criteria or expand them or to include security component uh, ability or basically could Ukraine be required to reach a peace deal before proceeding um, uh, and um, actually dealing with um, and negotiations and uh, so-called clusters of the EU key. All these issues are just a um, few of many to be met and to dealt with, but I hope um, that uh, this brief presentation outlined for you the whole complexity of issues which now being faced by Ukraine, by the Ukrainian government on its road to the EU accession and uh, Possibly the major challenge is how to merge, how to deal with the war, its consequences, its challenges, and how, what kind of peace deal is actually could trigger and bring Ukraine to the European Union.
Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I would be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you.